episode. Okay, so welcome again. This is my title slide. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce who we are. Um, we are Vasundra and Sabrina. Um, I am a speech recognition engineer. Uh, I work at a company called Dialpad. Um, and I've only had one paper accepted to PLOS One. I'm fairly new to this. If you're here because you haven't done this before, maybe you've done one before, then I am definitely in sort of the same boat as you. Um, and uh, I mean, honestly, I think the hardest part of writing is all of it, but particularly the introduction. Um, and uh, Sabrina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Sabrina Mielke. I'm a fourth year student at JHU, kind of taken the, the usual path. Um, so I think that's going to be a nice compliment. I've had a bunch of papers in the past few years at like Star CL conferences, um, um, some, some, uh, some workshop stuff, one at AAAI. Um, and I think the hardest part for me when I write a paper is coming up with like a good story and a good motivation and really trying to convince the reader that, no, 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 I'm not just interested in this because I'm weird. You should be interested in this as well. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. But the basic takeaway I think from this should be uh, writing a paper is hard for all of us. It's not just you. And um, yeah, hopefully this session is going to be helping you on your way to becoming a published author. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we assume that you are here at this workshop and at this tutorial in specific uh, because you want to write a paper on a topic. Um, but what is that process and how do you make it work? There's a lot of good reasons that you might want to write a paper. You might want to do it to connect with your peers. You might do it to learn something. You might want to do it to teach other people about something. Um, and they're all good reasons. Um, and I think the uh, first part of this tutorial is going to work, uh, is going to sort of focus on how you can match your reasons for doing, uh, for writing a paper with a venue that you might want to submit it to. Um, and what that whole process looks like. So the high level schedule of what this is going to look like is, like I said, we're going to do part A, the life of a paper, which will hopefully demystify some of the process if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then in part B, we're going to actually focus on some of the mechanics of writing good extended abstracts. Um, we decided that we would pick the extended abstract as a um, format to focus on uh, because those are common, those are interesting and hard and different from, from long papers and short papers. Um, and we also did want to have um, an interactive element. So we're going to finish it off with, um, with a peer review activity. Um, and if you've brought your, uh, if you've brought papers that you would like to have peer reviewed in breakout rooms, then you should uh, DM them to Sabrina uh, so that she can upload them somewhere and then everyone else can download the paper. So um, let's begin with part A. Uh, we're going to demystify the process of the sort of life cycle of a paper. Um, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot there's a lot of terminology here that you that can sort of feel very unfamiliar um, and feel new, especially I think with things like LaTeX and Overleaf. Uh, if you haven't used those before or um, been exposed to them before, but um, hopefully by the end of this, you feel a little bit more comfortable, um, at least sort of dipping your toe into the water of um, all of this. So we start with why you want to write a paper. Obviously, there's lots of good reasons. Um, and I think one thing that probably connects us all is that we want to write papers to advance our career, uh, whether you're an industry or an academia. Um, a paper sort of a sign that you're doing good research um, and that you've done new things. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of currency in the field. Um, so the um, important thing to remember is you need to fight that imposter syndrome. Um, I strongly believe that, you know, despite the fact that it can be overwhelming to know that other people are doing research in the same area as you and probably know a lot of things, you do know things and you can write about them. And, and it's about sort of, reworking sometimes your research and your experiments so that you are saying something new. Um, so let's assume that you've written your paper or you have an idea, you've done some experiments. Um, and let's say that you're considering a um, conference uh, to submit your paper to. Um, so we're going to use an example. We're going to use the IJC NLP conference as an example to show you what the call for papers looks like. Because this is going to be a huge and wonderful resource for you to figure out whether 
your experiment research paper fits within the context of this conference. Um, so it's it's clearly very long. So sort of several screenshots of the call for papers. Um, and as, as you can see, there's quite a bit, but it's actually logically organized into these different sections. Um, and I'm going to cover each section one by one. So um, the typical call for papers begins with the most important information, of course, right at the top, there will be various updates. So if there are any deadlines that have been extended, which happens on a somewhat regular basis because soft conf is annoying, um, then that is going to generally be right at the top so that you don't miss it when you go to the web page. Um, after that, there's generally some pretty generic conference information, like where it is, what the general dates are, what it's called. Um, and, uh, and of course, right after that, you have the important dates. So the dates are going to be important because this decides what your timeline is for getting the writing done, um, responding to reviews. Uh, Roshna asks if it is okay to post screenshots on Twitter. Um, I'm all right with that, uh, as long as you remember to put alt text on, your, on the images. Uh, Sabrina, are you okay with that? Yeah, I think as long as you just don't have any participant names in it other than us, that's that's totally fine. Um, we are going to make the slides available online. Yes, and also yes. post a link to them if you want to follow along. Yeah, there, well, Sabrina's all, already posted the link to the slides, I think, right? To the message before Roshna's. So, um, yeah. Um, all right. So, um, the thing to remember about these important dates, by the way, is that they can vary quite a bit depending on the venue that you're uh, looking at. So conferences tend to be, uh, well, workshops tend to be the fastest, after which it's conferences, and journals have really long turnaround time. So if you don't like hear back for a very long time, um, that is considered normal. Um, and uh, also, the you, you really need to be careful when you look at these important dates, because for some conferences, including ACL, um, there's a deadline for a paper abstract, um, or a summary of the work that's a week or so be before the deadline for the full paper. But if you don't make that first abstract deadline, then you're just you're just out. Um, and so you you need to show you need to make sure that you're aware of all the deadlines. So that's that's definitely a very important part of the call for papers. Of course, the call for papers does not end there. This is just part one of five. Um, part two talks about um, what different tracks there are, what kind of work fits into this uh, fits in this conference. Um, and so you can see um, on the right that there are, there's a whole lot of bullet points for this conference that cover a bunch of different areas, bunch of different applications. Um, and so the conference track basically that you choose or, or that you, um, uh, that your paper sort of fits into will decide who your reviewers are, um, because obviously we would like for your paper to be reviewed by people who who know the field, uh, who know specifically your subfield. Um, so the the sort of hierarchy goes something like reviewer and then area chair, and then area chairs sort of um, report to senior area chairs. Uh, and everyone is sort of under the program chair. The whole thing, the whole structure, the whole hierarchy is known as the program committee. So these are some terms that you may see. You might see them as acronyms. Uh, so AC, SAC, PC. PC, of course, is ambiguous because it could be either program chair or program committee. And you just sort of have to figure it out from context. Um, sometimes there are special tracks or focuses. So for example, at this conference, uh, there's a theme track, which is NLP for social good. Um, and uh, sometimes that might be something that is relevant to the work that you're looking to submit. Um, so part three um, describes what papers should look like. So it goes into a bit more detail. Um, and so, for example, this, uh, this call for paper says that they accept long papers and short papers, and it tells you the format for each of those. Um, it tells you whether there are any page limits. Well, there usually are page limits, so it tells you what they are. Um, it tells you what the format for appendices are and, and sort of how much additional information you can provide and what format that should be in. Um, and it goes over some important rules for paper writing. So this stuff is really important. And I think for me, this was 
um, all of this was very new and also kind of odd to me, but it, it does make sense. So the anonymity period is a period for which you keep the paper secret. And the idea is that your reviewers shouldn't sort of know who the paper is from or written by because that might bias their review of your paper. Um, and so uh, what that means, we, we will actually go into a little bit more detail about the anonymity period later, uh, but that's kind of a, an overview of what it is. Um, and finally, uh, double blind review essentially means that the review process um, is hidden from both sides. So you don't know who your reviewers are and your reviewers don't know who you are and we need to keep it that way. Um, so it's basically about keeping your identity secret. So um, the call for papers has, in, uh, has detailed information about both of these things. Um, part four includes uh, a few more sort of policies. So for example, uh, this conference has an ethics policy um, and sort of it goes into uh, goes into detail about submitting like an ethics impact statement. Not every conference may have this uh, or it may it may look different. So definitely it is useful uh, despite the fact that this is part four or five. So you have to scroll down quite a bit. It is very useful to actually read through the whole thing because this is important. Um, uh, it's sort of newer. Uh, but it's definitely helpful to check through in advance of the deadlines so that you can plan and set aside time to address all of these areas. Um, also included here uh, are things like reproducibility criteria. So um, uh, in, in the case of this conference, this is a, a reproducibility checklist that you sort of fill out uh, to declare sort of how much information you've given about reproducing your experiment. Um, and a multiple submission policy is basically about whether you can submit this paper that you've written to multiple places. Um, and the answer is generally no, but it's always worth checking because sometimes the answer is not no. Um, all right, so this has obviously been, you know, quite heavy so far, but we're, we're finally at the end of the call for papers, um, part five. So uh, this part is also really important. So um, it revolves around uh, paper submission and templates. Um, so there's, this was completely new to me and this blew my mind, but um, it turns out that all of these conferences, uh, it's, it's a very standard to have a template that is, in, that is like a Microsoft Word document or um, an Overleaf document. So it's a LaTeX template that you can just sort of lift and steal and fill out with your own paper. Um, and in fact, you should do this. You should always just use the template because otherwise you might sort of miss an alignment here or a font size there or um, page numbering or, or, or whatever. Um, and you, know, you might even get rejected just based on that. So always use the template no matter what. Um, and uh, may maybe this is new to some of you. Um, just also, kind of very yeah. briefly butt in there because I realize we don't have this on the slide, but if that happens to you, that's what people call a desk reject if it's rejected before it's even reviewed because you violated some very superficial criteria and nobody wants to get desk rejected. So. No, no one wants to get desk rejected, which is why read the call for papers. Um, so LaTeX usually requires a little bit of coding, but it's usually always recommended because it's much easier to ensure that you're sort of following the guidelines and that you're not going to be rejected. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so, and this sort of section also talks about um, yes. Uh, and this section also talks about um, the any optional supplementary materials. So whether you can provide appendices or uh, software or data um, and, and what that should look like and how that how you can do that while also maintaining uh, a double blind review. Um, and right at the end, of course, there's contact information. Um, and uh, this basically is for when you read the entire call for papers and you still have questions that you're unsure about or you feel like maybe you're, a, you're an edge case somewhere with a multiple submission policy or something like that, then you can contact um, the program chairs or the general chair to have your questions answered. Um, also a sort of bonus idea, if you would like to get more familiar with the process and especially that organizational hierarchy that I mentioned earlier, uh, volunteering is a good idea. You can volunteer at conferences. Um, sometimes they will cover the cost of attending the conference if you volunteer for them. So uh, if you're looking to maybe not submit a paper, but sort of just get a little bit more familiar with the process from uh, at, at closer range, then that's a good idea. 
Um, and uh, one last slide to show you what, uh, what LaTeX and Overleaf look like. Um, so this, uh, the sort of screenshot that's here on the right um, in the background is, is essentially the website Overleaf. So it's a website, which means that your paper is just going to be in the cloud. You're never going to accidentally lose it because your computer crashes, which is wonderful. You don't have to install anything because the website. Um, and it's also very easy to collaborate if you're writing this paper with other people. Um, there is also an offline Git bridge, which means that if you want to keep track of your changes, but also be able to work without internet access, that is a possibility as well. Um, so all of the templates are usually available on Overleaf for easy editing. So definitely make sure that you use that. It's a skill worth investing in. So assuming that you've gotten through the um, entire call for papers, it is now writing time. Um, except it's not because we're going to talk about that in part B. We're not done with part A yet. Um, so let's say that we have the paper. We're going to kind of skip over the writing process um, and uh, imagine that we've written the paper and it's beautiful and we want to submit it. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Sabrina to continue from here. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Um, so continuing the life cycle of a paper, I mean, now that you've written it, you got to land it. And the way to do it well is got to go to a conference. So you, you submit it online. Um, there are a few platforms that conferences use for submitting things online. What you see most in like uh, StarCL conferences like ACL, MLP, and so on is SoftConf. Um, and it often occurs in sentences that have various negative emotions attached to them um, because it's kind of an old tool and sometimes a little bit weird to get used to. You can follow the instructions and generally are going to be fine. Um, just sometimes it crashes the night before the conference. So yet another reason to not submit the day before the deadline. Um, another tool you might see is um, the Microsoft CMT3. Um, that one's used for ICML, Europe, AAAI, um, and a few workshops. Um, so you might see it. It's uh, more stable, uh, more complex. I like it better, um, but it's similar enough to SoftConf. And the last one you might see is Open Review, which um, I clear and some other workshops use. Um, that one's a little bit different um, because the conferences have the option to make the reviewing process kind of visible to everyone um, if they want. And so in this case, you would see the reviews of papers and you could even comment yourself, even if you're not a reviewer. And so this can be nice to get papers out there immediately and like have people talk about them while still preserving double blind. So not knowing the reviewers and not knowing the authors. Um, not all conferences do that though. So it's kind of a different thing. Um, just as a side note, ACL is migrating to a new system that is based on open review. So you may see more of that in the future. One little bonus tidbit, there is also a, a conference just listed on open review that's an anonymous preprint server. So if you want to get your work read, um, but you want to stay anonymous, um, maybe because you have to because of the anonymity period, that's a nice thing to use as well. Um, so a lot of interesting papers have been posted there before they were posted publicly on other sources. So that's a thing to, to maybe keep in mind. The one thing you will see, you probably have seen if you're reading papers um, or you are going to hear about is Archive, which is basically the preprint server. Um, it's a non-anonymous server, so there's always going to be names associated with it, um, both for preprints, so papers and, and drafts that are not yet published. Um, perhaps they're under review, perhaps they're not even submitted, um, and also postprints, so or what I'm going to call postprints. So if your paper has been accepted at a conference, you still maybe sometimes want to push it to Archive just to um, show it to more people and have it available somewhere else as well. So while there is no peer review on archive, so it is not an, even despite the name, it's not like an archival venue. Um, that's really just conferences that publish proceedings. Um, you still require to get authorization and refer to submit there so they don't have issues with spam. Um, so that might not be relevant to you yet, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, Haley asks, is there any etiquette about putting a paper on archive that you submitted elsewhere? Um, generally, I think people are very open to putting their papers on archive, no matter where else they might have been published, um, like ACL papers and a bunch of machine learning papers. Usually you will find an archive version just for that added publicity um, and, and the opportunity to have it be on archive, even if the original conference website goes down. Um, yeah, so, so people, people put a variety of things on archive, but if it looks like a paper, it's probably okay on archive. But again, it's... Uh, it's something that, that um, you need this authorization for. So probably something that becomes relevant later on. 
Yeah, it's it's true. Like once you're outside the ACL conferences and machine learning conferences, um, especially in journals, that's important to check. They might be more uh, less willing to have you put preprints or or postprints on archive. Um, so that's important. But again, archive um, cannot be anonymous. You always will have your name there. Um, so yeah. That's it for where to submit your papers. Um, now we already talked about something earlier and that's the anonymity period. And that's this kind of new, or I guess by now like two years old idea um, in the ACL community that since we want the double blind process, we don't want reviewers to know who wrote a paper because they might just be biased against the authors. We don't want the authors to publish their preprint like literally as the reviewers are reviewing paper because then they do that and the reviewer checks archive and it's like, oh, that's the paper I'm reviewing and it's written by this person. Well, that would be terrible. And so um, the ACL conferences have this anonymity period that says um, up to one month before the, uh, before the paper submission deadline, you're not allowed to publicly post your work on archive or on your web page or on social media or anything like that. Really just to prohibit this effect that reviewers find out who you are. It is okay to put it on archive earlier or like tweet about it earlier. Um, and that's nice. So you might still use that to get feedback, but the month before the submission is taboo for these things. Now, what is still okay um, is sending that paper to like friends and collaborators. So anything that's like uh, in a private setting, you can still send people drafts and ask for feedback. Um, it's really about the public in nature of it. That's not okay. Likewise, if you present in a closed venue, if it's like an invited talk you give somewhere, um, or like uh, talk in your department, totally fine to include that work. Um, and likewise, if you're informally chatting with someone, don't, don't be afraid to mention that work. Um, that's, that's absolutely okay. Now, there are some kind of weird edge cases where it's not really clear what you should be doing. Like putting things on your website is like probably bad, but if it's been on your website since before, am I, like do you have to take it down again? Um, what about putting things on your CV? Should you put it on your CV? Well, maybe not if the CV is public, but maybe yes, if you're using it to apply somewhere. So that's a little bit of a gray area. Um, you can always ask the program chairs about these kinds of things, but people are gonna have opinions on these mostly. Um, and if you're like me, you're probably gonna stay on the, on the safe side or try as much. Uh, can you mention on our CV? Um, I so this is this is that gray area, uh, Asheli, that like I personally listed on my website. Um, if I uploaded it before the anonymity period, I don't think uh, like I don't take it down anymore. Um, but that's a little sketchy. Um, so it, it really it's really hard to say. Um, and when in doubt, asking the program chairs is always a good idea. All right, next slide. Thank you. It took um, a long time to change. <laughs> that's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> all right. So uh, anyway, you submitted the paper. You paid attention to all the policies. Everything is great. A few weeks, a uh, few weeks go by, uh, maybe a month or two, um, depending on what you submit it to. And now reviews are in. Now there's two things that can happen. The first case is the one um, that if you continue, yes. The first case is the one where you got good scores, or you even got accepted. Sometimes you only get the scores, or sometimes you even get the final decision. Um, and in ACL, the scores are like from one to five. So people sometimes say, oh, I got a four, four, five on my paper, which means that two reviewers said it got a four out of five and one reviewer got a five out of five. So that's a really good score. Like that paper has good chances of getting in. If that's true for you, congrats. Um, the next step is what we call the camera ready. And that's really just the version of your paper that you are willing to hold into the camera, the version that's ready for publication. That one is going to have your name on it. It's going to have acknowledgments on it. It's going to uh, importantly fix things that reviewers said might need fixing. So you want to incorporate a lot of feedback there, answer any questions that reviewers might have had so that the reader basically has the best possible paper they could get. Now, the other case um, is, of course, the one where you got not so good scores or outright rejected. Um, and the very first most important thing is this is not unusual. In fact, it happens to everyone. Um, literally, I don't know any academic who has not had at least one paper rejected in their career. And this always sucks. Like you maybe get a little bit more used to it, but especially early on, it really sucks. Um, there's no way around it. It happens to us all though. Um, after you've read this initial review and you've gotten over the shock though, there's usually something good you can take out of it. Um, and most of the time, it's not that your work was bad or, or even irredeemable. 
there are just some small things that you might pay more attention to. For example, um, uh, reviewers might say, yeah, you have interesting claims, but I don't believe that this is going to work out. Do you have more experiments? So you might need to do more experiments. Or a reviewer says, well, there's a lot of experiments, but I don't know why you did them. Like, what's the overall storyline here? And so you might want to spend more time on that. Um, what is important? Does it load? <laughs> I did the thing. It's just taking its own sweet time. <laughs> yeah. Hooray, hooray for cloud services. Um, <laughs> one, thing, one thing that you should take away is that sometimes reviewers say things that you're like, wow, why do they say that? I mean, I wrote it very clearly here in section four, line 25. I mean, I thought this was clear. And often things are clear to you that are not as clear to the reviewer. And it's not always that the reviewer was just tasty and missed something. You really want to make sure that, uh, as I end up with this nicely, the truth is inescapable. Um, you really want to make sure that you as often as possible reinforce the core message and make sure that these things don't happen. Um, now, when you do that, you rewrite your paper a little bit and then you resubmit it to the next conference. Hopefully it'll be better and it'll have uh, benefited from these reviews. Most important thing um, that you wanna do in these reviews is really look out for things that are not clear. If something is not clear, chances are it's not that the reviewer is not very creative, but you just know your work so well that you didn't think to explain this very basic thing. So you're kind of biased in these things. So take these things um, and try to improve clarity. Pretty much every paper can be improved. One thing that can happen in between the scores and the acceptance rejection notification is what we call author response or rebuttal, um, where when you get the scores, you sometimes get the opportunity to react to the reviews and say something like, well, I see you were confused about this thing. Here's actually what we meant. Um, we're gonna put that correct in the final paper. Um, or, or something like, oh, you, you, were, you missed this experiment that you were asking for. We actually did this in section seven. It's just kind of small, you might've missed it. So that's, those are good opportunities to, to maybe raise your score and get accepted. What's important, don't pick a fight. It's not gonna work out. Um, if there really is something egregiously wrong with the review and this can happen, um, there is always an option to notify the area chair who is basically the one who stands above the reviewers that we said in the beginning. Um, and they can usually um, figure out what's going on. All right, so you eventually get accepted and now it's time for the conference. Two things that can happen um, that you get in your responses. Usually you either um, get to have a presentation like this one, um, which we also call an oral presentation, or you're making a poster for a poster presentation. One is not necessarily better than the other. Some papers are better suited to one thing than the other, um, and people have different preferences. So don't read too much into that. What I would say as a, as a, as a hint uh, or as, as a tip for you, um, once you go to a conference, try to actually use the especially poster session to ask people about how they wrote this paper. How did it go for them? Like this whole experience of, of starting with experiments and trying to piece it together. You will usually learn a lot that isn't written on the poster or in the paper. Like I, I love to ask people um, if, I, if I think that, that we're on, on, on like good footing. I'm like, so what didn't work out? You know, what is the, what is the thing that you're not talking about in the paper? Where are the pitfalls? Um, is what, what, what's the thing that's, you know, you don't want to put it in a paper, but it's really interesting to know. And so these things can be great. Also great for your imposter syndrome. Nobody's experiments work out on the first try usually. Like, it can be a very nice experience. But the, the life cycle is not done there, surprise. Um, in fact, you might even argue that one of the most important parts starts after. And that is you want to, um, like Mick Mitchell used this term, nourish your paper. I guess the slide is still loading. Um, but the idea is that... Um, you want to promote your paper. Um, I like this word better, it's a little nicer. And you might say, mm, self-promotion, that's kind of weird. But it really isn't weird um, because papers are essentially communication. You want to communicate to your peers. You want to share some knowledge. And so it's important that the people who you think are going to benefit from your paper are going to find your contribution. So ways to do that are, of course, putting it on your website, on archive, um, blogging about it or tweeting about it. So like a really sh nice, short, crisp summary I always love reading those. Um, they're not easy to write, but I think they're always a great thing to have. You might email some of your peers. You might email your friends if you think they're interested. Or um, if you know authors of related work um, that you know are interested in these kind of things, you can feel free to ping them um, and be like, hey, uh, I know we talked about this last conference. Here's something that I finally published. You know, something like that happens. Now, it's important, don't just message anyone who works in the same field. Um, it's really about the people who you know have an interest in you and have an interest in this paper to be like, hey, this thing I talked about, here it is. 
feel free to read it. Um, one thing that's also, also important, especially if you blog or tweet, find some senior people who are enthusiastic about your work, um, like your lab, your advisor, your department maybe, and ask them to signal boost, like um, ask them to retweet you or, or something like that, or, or give, a, give a presentation or something like that. And finally, the thing that's most important in this day and age um, has really become a big thing is if you open source your code and publish it on like GitHub and not just have random code, but like have it nicely documented and readable, that can do a lot for a paper and really help people pick it up and play with it. Again, papers are communication. You got to know, you probably have some sense of who your audience is and who you want this thing to be communicated to, and that should help you promote your paper. All right, I'm gonna pause the recording here. Or, well, I will switch the slide over and then I will. Okay. Um, oh, you did, excellent. Um, so uh, we are now at part B of uh, this tutorial where we talk about the actual writing process. So we talk about how to write a good extended abstract. Um, so the reason that we're focusing on the extended abstract is because it makes it, it's, it's sort of harder to give general advice that applies to everything, although we do have a slide that, that does talk about that. Um, but I think extended abstracts are sort of somewhat harder than the other formats because they're so there's limited space. Um, so the first question that I will ask you, let's say that you've done some research. Um, what if you had only five slides to explain what you did to someone um, and you cannot cheat and use animation? What if you had only five tweets? Um, that's a limited number of characters. What if you only had one elevator ride with someone who's a senior researcher and that you, and you want to sort of explain how cool your, your project was and um, how cool your experiments were and what you found out? What would you discuss in that? How much would you set up? How much would you focus on the different sort of pieces of what you did? Um, that's kind of the essence, and that's the question that should guide all of your thinking around writing an extended abstract. Because a good one of these just quickly tells a story, like a five minute talk. Um, and so you need to make sure that this, that the answer to this question is sort of underpinning your whole process and your whole sort of thought around writing one of these. So the extended abstract is short. Um, all of this is, all of the stuff on the slide is like way too long you would actually want to cut it down to something like this. All I'm trying to say in this slide is that you need to tell a compelling story fast and to remind you that you cannot share everything that you want. So you may not have time to say that five minute talks are harder than a 15 minute talk. You may not have time to say, you know, a common failure mode is that you have too much background work. You really have to just sort of condense it because that's the format of the extended abstract. Um, and that can feel hard because obviously you've put a lot of effort into this, you've spent a lot of time on this, and so you might want to share a lot of details, um, but it's, it's really not something that you can do. Um, all right, so the extended abstract is short. Um, this is what it should look like if you were, conver in, if you were converting something like a short paper to an extended abstract, it should just be that short. Um, so. I'm gonna show you sort of the skeleton that we recommend for an extended abstract. Um, it should have about these five sections. Um, with the introduction, you should sort of very quickly in one sentence contextualize the problem. Generally, this format does not have an abstract or does not require an abstract. You can typically just lift the first sort of paragraph um, and put it into softconf if there's a softconf field that you need to fill out that asks for an abstract. So don't waste space writing an abstract in addition to the introduction. Um, when you talk about related work, you really need to only specify everything that is directly relevant to setting up your experiment. There's obviously a lot of research that you have probably done leading up to it, um, but you simply do not have the space to um, go into all of it. So you just have to succinctly say what sets it up and what about your work is new because that's not always necessarily obvious. Um, so it's, it's a good idea to sort of highlight the novelty of your research. Uh, and then after that, you get into sort of the meat, which is the methods, the models, the data. Um, like we have said, extended abstracts are very short. So replication is not the goal. You don't need to go into um, 
uh, sort of the gory details of how you did this. Um, you just want to present the central ideas of what you did. Um, and once you have done that, then you can go to the results. And it's a good idea for this format in particular to have one central sort of number or insight or takeaway that you want people to, um, to walk away with after they read your extended abstract. Um, and then that allows your conclusion to also be, you know, quite punchy and short where you just reinforce that takeaway and you show how it addressed the problem that you um, contextualized sort of right at the beginning in your introduction. So this is, this is sort of the format that we recommend tends to work um, and make sure that you don't go too heavy on the intro and related work um, sections because though that tends to be a pretty common failure mode for these. So um, it's important to remember here also that most people don't really read papers you don't really read a paper in the same way that you read um, a novel from start to finish. Uh, typically, you skim a paper, um, and you might also jump around a lot. Typically, you know, uh, when when you read a paper, uh, the hope is that you are sort of, you know, maybe looking at a figure, maybe reading the, maybe skimming the introduction, then reading the results um, and the conclusion to see what what happened, and then you might go back to the methods if you're if you're interested to find out like how they did that. Um, and so knowing how a reader approaches reading an extended abstract or a paper um, should help you design your paper so that it actually gives them the information that they need without making it kind of a painful process where they have to jump around and they're missing context and that sort of thing. Um, and so as a consequence, there are some pretty common rules for writing in general that Sabrina is going to tell you about. Yeah, really just following this process of how you read, read a paper or how people you know read papers um, gives you a bunch of common rules pretty quickly. Um, the first one being, again, you want to get to the point as soon as possible, because if I read a paper, I might read the abstract, I might read like the first sentence of the introduction. And if I don't see where this is going, am I going to put in the time to read the rest? Not so sure. Um, likewise, um, you don't want to write like a diary. You, you really want to focus on the final result, like writing chronologically, like first I did this, uh, but it didn't work out. And then I had this different idea and that didn't quite work out, but here's how I've made it work. That's just for one wasting space, but also I really want to know what's going on from the start. That also means no plot twists, right? If you, if you say like, oh, we're going to find out, is this really true? Stay tuned. I'm just going to be annoyed. I'm not like, you can tell me who the murderer is from the start. That's fine. I want to know. And now show me how you found out. Show me the clues that led you to identify who did it. Um, so really don't have any plot twists in your papers. Um, and that comes with writing a good and honest introduction. As after the introduction, really highlight the main results. You might have done a lot of work. There might be many results, but not everything is going to fit and not everything needs to fit, especially in an extended abstract. Really, if you just have one big takeaway, one thing that you think is interesting and worth pointing out, that's enough. Um, that can be really interesting. And don't water it down by having more experiments that are not necessary. Um, and I say that kind of in a vague sense of what is an experiment was in result. Um, it doesn't have to be numbers. Like it doesn't have to be blue score goes up. Like sure, that's a result. But sometimes the qualitative observations are even more interesting. Something like, it seems to fail on this grammatical construction, or I noticed something interesting with this particular language. And you might not even know why, but just that you notice it, and that is already a result. Um, if you talk about methods, and you probably will talk about methods a bit, even though not too much, don't go too deep into the technical details on an extended abstract. Like, I don't need to know exactly how it works as long as I have some sense of what was going on. You can kind of picture what it overall looks like. Um, a consequence of that is that if you write a long detailed report, you might need a lot of notation and abbreviations to describe everything. You don't need that in an abstract. So really pick your notation, your abbreviation um, very deliberately. I'm not saying don't use any, they're useful, um, but don't overdo it, only what helps. And finally, the most, um, the most difficult thing, I think personally, um, is paying attention to the flow. Um, so what does that mean? That sounds kind of vague. It's really like, maybe you've done this yourself. You've written or read a paper and the paper then says, uh, now we're gonna be talking about this. It kind of depends on this thing that we're gonna talk about later on, but for now, just imagine we had covered it or maybe jump ahead, but then you jump ahead and that thing says, oh, but really we wanted to talk about the other thing first. 
Um, and it's just a mess and you have to keep jumping around. It wastes space and it wastes the attention. Um, and so minimizing this kind of friction is really what it's all about. Like a paper that you can read start to finish, knowing that readers are not gonna necessarily do that, but just something that makes sense as it goes through the story and doesn't jump around. Um, and that can be really difficult. So for that, um, I will give advice that is just rewrite your paper a lot. You're going to want to do that um, anyway. But the thing that I specifically would recommend is after you've done your first pass, you just do your first pass. You just write, write basically everything out that you think is going to be necessary. You kind of try and you don't look at the pages yet, but try to be short. Chances are, though, like your first uh, pass is going to give you something that's way too long. Um, and in particular, some things are going to flow well and some things are just going to flow horribly. And you'll be like, mm, this was really the wrong order to write things in. And that'll be good information that you can use for the second pass in which you take the first pass and you toss it in the bin um, and you just write it from scratch. Now that sounds harsh, um, but the thing is that if you do that, you will remember the good parts from your paper and you'll be like, oh, I had this really clever way of saying what I did. Let me write that down again, but it will be cleaner and you will not make the same mistakes that you did before again. It's kind of a way to start fresh without any of that weird jumpy stuff. And so completely rewriting from scratch is a good thing. Um, don't copy paste yet. For your third and fourth pass, okay, well, it kind of depends on how much work you want to put in. I still think it's worth to rewrite it again, but at some point you are going to just start polishing what you have, um, fixing some sentences up, and then rigorously cutting things down until you fit into the page limit. And then hopefully you're going to have an abstract. Now, there are some small things um, aside from these bigger rules that apply to all scientific writing um, that are just practical tips that we figured it will be good to, to talk about. Again, we said use LaTeX. Um, even if some conferences have a word template, it's usually not worth it. It gets more, it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, and using LaTeX is not all that wild, especially if you use Overleaf and the template, you can get very far. Like you don't have to learn all the internals of LaTeX, just need to know one or two basic commands and that's all. There are some really useful packages that people recommend like book tabs to make your tables look nice, to-do notes, so you can leave little to-do notes for your collaborators in the draft. Um, and there's some more we'll have on a later slide. The one thing that is just annoying enough to go from pet peeve to actual issue is that many papers have like pixel images, like screenshots of, of plots or something. And that generally looks really blurry and doesn't print well. So if you have like a plot or something, try to use it as a PDF. So if you export from Excel or PowerPoint, they can usually export as PDF and then it'll be clean and sharp vector images. Also possible if you use matplotlib or Altair or something, they can also export as PDFs um, or SVGs. Um, that will get you what you want. Um, if you want to put in the time, and I personally love doing that, but it is, it is putting in time, you can also learn to manipulate these vector images yourself with Inkscape or Illustrator, but that's really going further than any other person would have written on the slide. Um, there's some other, there's some other small things um, like some people confuse uh, citations with like, if you have something in text, like the authors, blah, 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 show that versus something, uh, we know that this holds. And then in parentheses, the citation, those are different, don't mix them up. But all of these things you will usually find in documents like the one that's linked here um, that really shows you the formatting, like the standard ACL template comes with all these things. It tells you what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Um, so just go through those and, and try, to, try to stick to them as much as you can. If you want to know more about these kinds of fine grade things, um, we have a bunch of resources here that might help you writing, might help you late taking and all that. Um, you can check that out from the slides um, that we're going to send around. And so, uh, yeah, the, with that, that is how you write a thing in a nutshell. <laughs> so we're going to stop the recording here um, and go on to our final activity.